My name is Linda Musumechi, and I'm the Director of Grants and Fellowships at the American Philosophical Society. Welcome to this public program of the Society. I'm glad that you have joined us this evening for a portion of our Women's History Month programming. The American Philosophical Society is located, as it has been since its earliest days, in Lenape Hoking, the homeland of the Lenape people, the real people. We at the APS recognize their continued presence and honor their community and those of our other Native peoples, especially through the working partnerships and fellowships of our Center for Native American and Indigenous Research. Reflecting the spirit of inquiry of our founder, Benjamin Franklin, the American Philosophical Society is a participatory organization governed by its highly distinguished members for the continuing purpose of promoting useful knowledge. The society's mission is supported and advanced by a staff of about 50 individuals committed to the APS idea, inclusion, diversity, equity, and access. We advance our mission with the engagement of leading scholars, scientists, and professionals through election to membership and opportunities for interdisciplinary intellectual fellowship, particularly in our semi-annual meetings. We serve scholars through an internationally recognized research library, collecting, preserving, and sharing manuscripts, artwork, books, and artifacts of enduring historic value. We support wide ranging research and discovery through grants and fellowships, publications, prizes, and public exhibitions and lectures. The Society's grant and fellowship program funds nearly 200 scholars annually and awards more than $1 million. Our Franklin Research Grant Program, which supports research related travel in all fields of knowledge, assists roughly 100 scholars each year and regularly awards more than $550,000. Tonight, we are extremely pleased to have with us Dr. Faye Shao, who received a Franklin grant in 2019, and her collaborator, Dr. Ping Zhu, to discuss their current book, Feminisms with Chinese Characteristics. We're, we are also honored to have here with us to introduce the discussion and moderate the Q&A, Dr. Karen Thornburg. Dr. Thornburg is Harry Tuckman Levin Professor in Literature and Professor of East Asian Languages and Civilizations at Harvard University. Her research and teaching focus on comparative literature, global literature, and the literatures and cultures of East Asia in the context of the environmental humanities, the medical and health humanities, and social justice, including environmental, economic, ethnicity, race, gender, and sexuality. She is the author of Empire of Texts in Motion, Chinese, Korean, and Taiwanese Transcultura Transculturations of Japanese Literature, which came out in 2009, Echo Ambiguity, Environmental Crisis and East Asian Literatures, published in 2012, Global Healing, Literature Advocacy Care, which came out in 2020, as well as Gender Justice and Contemporary Asian Literatures. Dr. Thornburg is also editor or co-editor of four scholarly volumes and more than 80 articles and book chapters, and she is an award-winning translator of Japanese literature. So without further delay and with great pleasure, I pass the screen and the microphone to Dr. Karen Thornburg. Okay, so thank you so much, Linda, for that wonderful introduction. I'm, I'm so honored to be here this evening uh, with all of you, and I'm very thankful to the American Philosophical Society for their generosity and for also holding forums such as these that bring us together to discuss the incredible work that, is, that comes out of these generous grants. So I'm really delighted this evening uh, to be discussing with you all, or actually I won't be doing discussing, we'll, we'll have the um, APS grant recipients doing the discussing. We will be discussing uh, this amazing book, Feminisms with Chinese Characteristics, edited uh, by Professor Fei Xiao and Professor Ping Zhu. So I'll now introduce uh, both Professor Xiao and Professor Zhu, and then we'll turn the microphone over to them. They'll speak for about 30, 35 minutes, and the remainder of our time together will be open uh, for discussion. So please do uh, type your questions into the Q&A button. Uh, we will try to get to as many questions as possible. The more succinct you can make your questions, the better the chances of, of us answering them in a, in a satisfactory way because our time is unfortunately limited. 
Professor Xiao is professor and chair of East Asian Languages and Cultures at the University of Kansas. She is the author of Family Revolution, Marital Strife in Contemporary Chinese Literature and Visual Culture from 2014. She's also the author of Youth Economy, Crisis and Reinvention in 21st Century China, Morning Sun in the Tiny Times from 2020. She's co-edited the volume, Feminisms with Chinese Characteristics, from 2021 that we'll be discussing today. Uh, currently, she's working on her third scholarly monograph titled The Hen Cackles in the Morning, Gendered Soundscape and Female Leadership in Modern Chinese Literature and Culture. Professor Zhu is Associate Professor of Chinese Literature at the University of Oklahoma. She serves as the acting editor-in-chief of the journal Chinese Literature Today. She's also author of Gender and Subjectivities in Early 20th Century Chinese Literature and Culture that came out from Palgrave in 2015. And she's the co-editor of Maoist Laughter from Hong Kong University Press, published in 2019. And of course, she's a co-editor with Professor Xiao of Feminisms with Chinese Characteristics. Um, and I will now turn the microphone over to Professor Xiao and Professor Zhu. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Somber, for your very nice introduction. So uh, let me share my screen now. And, and also before I start, I would say uh, we are very honored to have Professor Somber to serve as our moderator for, to, uh, for tonight's book talk, uh, given her expertise in China studies and also gender studies, and particularly given her forthcoming new book on gender justice in Asia. Uh, and also I'd like to uh, give thanks to American Philosophical Society for giving me the Franklin Research Grant that enabled me to conduct an international uh, you know, research trip, also my last research trip, you know, before the pandemic started, uh, so that I can, uh, I can, I can uh, do my field work in China. Uh, so, and, and, and thank you, um, Linda and Jessica for setting up everything. And also, uh, lastly, but not the least, thanks to Ping for joining joining uh, today's joint book talk. So I'm going to introduce the structure of the talk first. Uh, so as you can see, first of all, um, Ping is going to explain the meaning of the title. So uh, uh, feminisms with Chinese characteristics. And then I'm going to provide a genealogy of Chinese feminisms uh, starting from the late 19th century and also uh, the post-1995 developments of, of China's feminist politics. And then Ping will emphasize uh, the importance of conceptualizing a feminist politics with Chinese characteristics. And then last, I'm going to uh, provide a brief summary of each chapter to illustrate this pluralistic visions and the practices of contemporary Chinese feminisms in an age of globalization. And then we are going to open the floor for Q&A. Okay, so now I'm going to hand it over to Ping. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Fei. And also like Fei, I'd like to first thank American Philosophical Society for having me today. And I, I want to thank Jessica and Linda for your beautiful organization. And uh, it's my honor to have Professor Thomber, to, uh, whose scholarship I admire deeply, to be our moderator. And thank you, Fei. I know that it, uh, it's because of you that I am here also co-presenting this uh, new, new volume we, uh, we co uh, added together. So please go to the next slide, Fei. Okay, so I'm going to first explain the title of this volume, Feminisms with Chinese Characteristics. The two key words of this volume are feminisms and Chinese characteristics. Feminisms can be translated as nu quan zhu yi or women's rights-ism or nu xing zhu yi, literally women, woman-ism in Chinese. But those two phrases are not interchangeable. The term nu quan zhu yi can be found in the writings produced in the early 20th century in China. And uh, 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 the, the term nu xing zhu yi gained prominence 
女性主义 can also mean、uh, women's special needs and consciousness. It gained prominence in the 1980s. One of the leading Chinese theorists of female feminism, Li Xiaojiang, is a contributor of this volume. However, neither female feminism or female feminism were used during the socialist period, which preferred female liberation or women's liberation and female equality, equality between men and women. Today, many Chinese women have still endorsed this kind of feminism. And they refuse to be associated with neither female feminism or female feminism. Next slide, please, Fei. We can see a dilemma of Chinese feminisms in those different ideas and practices for the woman question, which is a dilemma between specificity and equality. Different feminist groups obviously have different agendas and appeals. Uh, like what Nancy Fraser says in her 1995 essay,、uh, as I quote, "Whereas the logic of redistribution is to put gender out of business as such, the logic of re recognition is to valorize gender specificity." How can feminists fight simultaneously to abolish gender differentiation and to valorize gender specificity? Then,、um, this is a complex question. That all feminists, all women in the world, must face. The Chinese answer to this dilemma, therefore, has a greater transnational significance. When we try to understand and evaluate the, this dazzling picture of multifarious Chinese feminisms, we are not only tackling a challenge within a nation, but also exploring a valuable asset that the Chinese history can offer to feminists at large.、Uh, next slide, please. The other keyword Chinese characteristics was a neologism invented by Westerners in the late 19th century.、Uh, the first of such usage came from the English economist and writer John Bowring's Chinese Characteristics, published in 1865.、Uh, and American missionary Arthur Henderson Smith's Chinese Characteristics was published in Shanghai in 1890, and it was widely circulated in China and East Asia. In those writings, Chineseness was racialized, oftentimes in a negative way, as a result of the colonial encounter. And in the later period, the new cultural reformers in the nine,、uh, between 1915 to 1920s and the later socialist revolutionaries both set out to reform the Chinese tradition, namely those Chinese characteristics under the Western gaze, following the Western model and the Marxist paradigm. Respe uh, respectively, in eighteen in nineteen eighty four, when the Chinese leader Deng Xiaoping met a, Jap a Japanese delegation, he emphasized that Marxism must be integrated with the reality in China, and socialism must be geared to the Chinese reality as well. Since then, the phrase Chinese characteristics has become the official translation of Chinese characteristics. Or Chinese char characteristics, as it appeared in the epithet "China Socialism," or in English, "Socialism with Chinese Characteristics." This epithet justifies China's integration into the world capitalist system in the post-socialist period, under the premise that the Chinese Communist Party must remain the sole ruling party of China. Therefore, this signifies. The party's monopoly on explaining and defining Chineseness. Next slide, please. Whether as a racialized term or as a political guideline, the Chinese characteristics in history has always pre proposed a binary structure: be it East, East versus West, traditional versus modern, or socialism versus capitalism. From a grand perspective, the history of the 20th century China is a history when the binary structures and the patriarchal hierarchies embedded in the epithet Chinese characteristics were challenged, dismantled, and re replaced by various feminist ideas and practices in alliance with other revolutionary ideas and practices across the multiple centers and the peripheries created by the patriarchal powers. One of the main purposes of this volume is to show that Chinese feminisms must remain plural. Plurality is an effective strategy for subverting the systematic oppressions that oftentimes exercise their power 
through creating, maintaining, and consolidating binary structures. Plurality, on the other hand, does not mean replacing the critique of the systematic problems with fragmented strategies. Rather, it invites pluralistic thinking, systematic thinking. The next slide, please. Recently, the New York Times published an essay titled, Who is the Real China? Iling Gu or the Chained Women? Woman. We can realize the limit of any singular feminism when faced with the juxtaposition of these two female images, and would be compelled to ask questions such as, what is Chineseness? Who can be the subject of Chinese feminisms? What is the end goal of Chinese feminist movement? Ilingu is a sim symbol of the competition between two great powers and hotly pursued by the capital, while the chained woman in uh, Fengxian, Xuzhou, China, is suffering from cruel, gendered violence, remnant feudal ideology, poverty, um, unbalanced gender ratio, and a misogynist government, to name just a few. The vast differences between these women suggest systematic problems that can not be tackled alone on the individual level, or the family level, or the economic level. It has to be tackled simultaneously on multiple levels. The next slide, please. Therefore, by just opposing the plural feminisms with the plural Chinese characteristics, we intend to deconstruct the binary structures and the patriarchal hierarchies embedded in history, language, race, culture, and the politics. We propose a broader use of feminisms in this volume to contest and open up Chinese characteristics as a notion constrained by racism, traditionalism, nationalism, or hierarchical structures in different historical periods. And at the same time, we propose to view the ensemble of the Chinese feminisms as a transnational product that seeks to situate the renewed imaginary notion of Chineseness in the global context. We argue that the strength of Chinese feminisms lies precisely in their plurality and the plural Chinese characteristics that they simultaneously challenge and redefine. This new volume consists of scholarly articles, interviews, and talks from a representative group of women and gender studies scholars, women writers, and activists in mainland China, Hong Kong, and the United States, Europe. This hybrid model allows us to pinpoint the multifaceted and the dynamic contentions and representations of contemporary Chinese feminisms in a single volume one that does not intend to present an authorial voice of any singular form of Chinese feminism, but instead sets a stage for multiple voices, analysis, and interpretations of contemporary Chinese feminisms, which constantly substantiate, underline, supplement, contradict, offset, and dialogue with each other. And with that, I'll hand over to my collaborator, uh, Faye. Okay, thank you, Ping, for uh, laying the theoretical foundation and in, 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 in for explaining the title uh, so beautifully. And, and, and I'm trying to find that unmute button. So I was, you know, looking around for that small button there. Uh, so so as, you, as you have beautifully put, so basically we do see this diversity and uh, plurality in contemporary feminist practices and visions, but actually if we turn back to look at the history or genealogy of Chinese feminisms, also we do see this very uh, pluralistic history. So the birth of Chinese feminisms can be traced back to the turn of the 20th century when China was plagued with a series of military defeats, foreign invasions, and economic crisis. So uh, Chinese elites were seeking new ways to start China sinking into a backwater colony in this colonial capitalist global system. So progressive Chinese male intellectuals and political activists turned to a nationalist feminist agenda. They advocated for female education, abolition of food binding, a new sexual morality, and even gynocentrism in the hope that women could live a happier and healthier life so that they could contribute to the birth of, of a modern nation state and its younger and, 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 and stronger citizens. So uh, for many early male fe feminists, 
women's emancipation was part of a larger project of enlightenment and the national self-strengthening. So in modern China, male authored discourse on women's liberation and the female empowerment emerged as a counter discourse to the Western gaze that perpetuated the image of China as a woman. So as, as uh, my co-auditor Ping Zhu's previous study shows, modern Chinese intellectuals in the early 20th century sought to challenge the racialized view of gender hierarchy to change the power structure embedded in the heterosexual dichotomy in the Western gates and to reject the bio destiny of the Chinese race. Some women writers, activists, and revolutionaries had joined their male peers to advocate gender equity within the nationalist feminist framework, while others criticized their male chauvinist views of gender history and the modern nation state. From its very beginning, Chinese feminist, feminism could not be understood as singular. Under the umbrella term of Nu Quan or women's rights, anarchist, socialist, liberal, evolutionary, eugenic, and nationalist positions shaped various feminist articulations and cultural imaginations for a modern China. So from the first beheaded um, Chinese feminist martyr Chiu Jing to the first Chinese anarchist feminist He Yingzhen, from the new woman to the modern girl, from women suffragists to women soldiers, to mothers of national citizens, Chinese women were endowed with different identities and agencies, despite the overarching nationalist agenda in the persisting patriarchal system. Many radical May Force feminists later joined the Chinese Communist Party or CCP during the Yan'an period and brought their feminist agenda into the core of the party. Women's liberation was a significant part of the Chinese socialist revolution after the Yan period. As Wang Zhen has observed, the term feminism was deemed too bourgeois during this period. So Ping already talked about this. So that is why the slogans including Fu Nu Jie Fang or women's liberation and Nan Yu Ping Deng or equality between men and women were more favored by uh, the CCP and were listed on the official political agenda. So in 1949, the All China Women's Federation was established with its local branches reaching all the way to the neighborhood level uh, in urban areas and to the village level in rural areas all over China. Women's Federation under the leadership of senior women cadres within the CCP promoted a series of national policies aiming for gender equity. Equal employment and, and equal pay were legalized, and the new public facilities were established to provide free services to reduce working women's burden of childcare and housework. As a result of the state feminism that was beheaded as a formally institutionalized political campaign, women's social status, literacy rate, educational level, reproductive health, workforce, and political participation have all been enormously improved. In 2009, the number of female students surpassed that of uh, male college students for the first time in Chinese history. And also a few years ago, the male uh, holders of master's degree also surpassed uh, the, the number of their male counterparts. And, uh, the, employ the employment rate among Chinese women aged 16 to 64 is the highest not only in East Asia, but stays in the top tier of employment rates for women in the entire world. Although women in the workplace still face um, sexist discrimination in its various forms, China's gender pay gap is the narrowest in East Asia and smaller than that of some of the developed countries, including the United States. The remarkable practices and ideas of socialist feminism were gradually undermined, however, when China embraced a market economy since 1980s. The discipline of women's studies, or Fu Nu Yanjiu in Chinese, that emerged in the 1980s in China advocated the drastic economic and the theoretical turn toward marketization and globalization. The first generation of women studies scholars in post-socialist China bid farewell to the era of revolutions. They deliberately kept a distance from socialist feminism and the Marxist social theories on social egalitarianism and gender equity. 
Intellectuals in the post-socialist peer, peer, period emphasized rediscovering and restoring women's real natural feminine singularity, which is often materialized through commodified ways of self-expression. Further appropriating a market individualism discourse, a backlash of patriarchal conservatism devalued the socialist or feminist legacy by condemning Chinese women who grew up in the Mao era as over-liberated and thus unfeminine. This was a period when masculinity and the power came together. On the one hand, the criticism of Maoism was from a masculinist perspective. And on the other hand, issues concerning gender division of labor, women's decreasing level of political participation and a massive layoff of women workers and structural inequalities was systematically neglected. And then the year 1995, when the Fourth World Conference on Women was held in Beijing, marks a historical milestone in the development of the Chinese feminist movement. The conference was attended by more than 17,000 participants. In addition, a parallel NGO forum was opened in Huairo in the suburbs of Beijing. It hosted 60 symposiums and 35 exhibitions and drew over 30,000 attendees. The 1995 conference ushered in a new age for the globalization of Chinese feminisms by bringing transnational resources and the discourses into China, into Chinese women's studies and the Chinese feminist practices. Following the 1995 World Conference on Women, some of the earliest women's NGOs got further development through the support of transnational funding and increased media visibility. In many cases, NGOs and the Women's Federation have developed a collaborative working relationship to pool resources and to carry out their advocacy campaigns. This collaboration between NGOs with the Women's Federation is a distinctive mode of contemporary Chinese feminisms. These NGOs have spread feminist ideas in China, linked to some Chinese women with the world, and greatly transformed the programs, practices, and the languages of Chinese feminisms. Meanwhile, their unprecedented publicity and transnational networks also alerted the state that the Chinese feminist program had exceeded the capacity of the government to control its agenda. To understand the shifting social political conditions in post-socialist China, a certain paradigm of Chinese characteristics should not be omitted. So an another paradigm of Chinese characteristics that is neoliberalism with Chinese characteristics. In his book, A Brief History of Neoliberalism, David Harvey put, uh, portrays the outcome of China's neoliberalization in the post-socialist era as the construction of a particular kind of market economy that increasingly incorporates neoliberal elements interdigitated with authoritarian centralized control. This shift to neoliberalism with Chinese characteristics represents the latest alliance of economic neoliberalism and ideological neoconservatism. While a neoliberal market rationale shapes um, the reconfiguration of the economic realm and social institutions. Centralized management and the containment of public spaces have also been consolidated. In the wake of the paradigmatic transformation of the state's agenda from equity-centered socialist revolution, including women's liberation, toward an efficiency-driven marketization and privatization, women of younger generations working in Chinese feminist NGOs found themselves faced, at, faced with a different set of gender-specific issues and problems. As a result, the gender programs championed by these younger feminists who are generally better educated and urban based are often preoccupied with concerns mainly relevant to young urban professionals and appear to be less resonant with working class women. 
These struggles are often limited to individual freedom and rights. Although a growing number of feminists have started paying more attention to the intersection of class and gender, not all transnational NGOs are committed to connecting with women of lower classes from different age groups and in the rural areas, for many of whom the socialist legacy is still at work in their conceptualization of gender equity and rights. All these tensions between socialism and capitalism, history and the present, local and global, rural and urban, as well as academia and activists, calls for a new theoretical framework of understanding feminisms with Chinese characteristics beyond all these binary structures. So, and then uh, I, I'm going to turn it over to Ping and she's going to discuss more about this new feminist politics. Thank you, Fei. Uh, from Fei, the genealogy introduced by uh, Fei, we can see that pluralistic thinking and intersectional conceptualization, which can be regarded as a special form of plurality, uh, they have been the salient features of Chinese feminist politics throughout the 20th century. The next slide, please, Fei. Pluralistic thinking and the shifting positions of the Chinese feminisms have helped us challenge the various hegemonic forms of patriarchy, such as Orientalism, racism, nationalism, socialism, and in our current age, neoliberalism, capitalism, and uh, as well as intersectional conceptualization uh, that allows feminism to address the systematically organized totalities that cannot be solved individually or in isolation. Nearly a century ago, the anarchist feminist He Yingzhen conceptualized gender not simply as a form of social identity determined by sexual distinction, but a mechanism to, as I cite, uh, uh, create forms of power and domination based on that distinction, end of quote, in a structurally unequal society. He Yingzhen's Groundbreaking feminist vision suggests that if it is far from enough, if women only focus on discovering their female consciousness, writing about their bodies or narrating their personal histories, because women's consciousness, bodies or histories are always already defined by masculinist visions and patriarchal power. She used the notion shenqi or livelihood to expose the institution of private property that subjugated women in history and called for the elimination of all capitalists. During the new culture movement, uh, Western feminism was already challenged. One of the earliest Chinese Marxists, Dai Ji Tao, argued in his 1920 essay, essay titled The Intersection Between Laborers' Movement and the Women's Movement that most Chinese women could not obtain liberation either through women's suffrage movement or obtaining financial independence. Because as I quote, they would barely escape the prism of the family before they wear the chains of wage labor, end of quote. Dai Ji Tao concluded that only by intersecting the women question with the labor question could a transformative solution be found. My first book, as uh, Faye mentioned already, also explores the centrality of the feminine at the intersection of gender and the race in modern China. The intersection between gender and the class continue to dominate the socialist gender ideology. One of the biggest achievements of the socialist state feminists was their effort to redefine women and femininity not based on gender difference, which consequently allowed women to do away with gender difference and claim equal status with men. In 2004, two Chinese feminist scholars, Chen Shunxing and uh, Dai Jinghua, edited Women, Nation, and Feminism, stressing the crucial importance of examining the women's question at the intersection of gender and the geopolitics. They included a lot of uh, writings from the third world countries in this volume. All these examples show that Chinese feminists' historical strengths of intersectionality and plurality. Uh, next slide, please, Fei. However, these historical legacies of Chinese feminism have faced setback today with, when consumerism, individualism, and feudalism join hands to revive the old gen binary gender ideology in China. What Chinese feminists currently face is a postmodern landscape where new Confucianism exists side by side with neoliberalism, 
where socialist aspirations merge with capitalist expansion and where politics and the culture join hands to cement the traditional gender hierarchy. The so-called mistress economy and the female virtue uh, school, as you can see from the slide, are but two examples of the specter of poly polygamy, uh, a phrase used by Dai Jinghua, one of the contributors in this volume. This specter of polygamy is once again trying to enslave contemporary Chinese women. Next slide, please. One contributor of this volume, Nicol, uh, Nicholas Bukowski's recent study shows that uh, around 2010, a new theoretical strand with Chinese, within Chinese feminism has been forming, which she labels socialist feminism or critical socialist feminism. The root of this so-called socialist feminism can be dated back to the new left thought that emerged in China in the mid 1990s, which coincided with the systematic import of neoliberal feminisms into China. But socialist feminisms are different from the neo uh, leftist, new leftists in, in that the latter remains to be gender blind by focusing exclusively on the category of class. While socialist feminism is just one of the many feminisms in contemporary China, the rise of socialist feminism in China indicates the crucial importance of preserving critiques of systematic problems, such as the inequalities perpetuated by the neoliberal world order formed in the post-Cold War era, and the specters of patriarchy revived by the victory, cap victory of capital in various social sectors. Just as Nancy Fraser says, claim in the neoliberal age, claims for justice were increasingly couched as claims for the recognition of identity and difference that dovetailed all too neatly with a rising neoliberalism that wanted nothing more than to repress all memory of social e e egalitarianism. Uh, in conclusion, Throughout history, of, uh, throughout, throughout history, the pluralistic thinking and intersectional positions of Chinese feminisms have helped us challenge various hegemonic forms of patriarchy. This revolutionary power of Chinese feminisms must be revived if we place the notion of Chinese characteristics under interroga uh, interrogation and open it up for more uh, for more pluralistic thinking and practices. We believe that only by challenging and opening up Chinese characteristics can we challenge and open up the possibilities of an alternative world and a counter history. So uh, with that, I'll uh, hand over to Fei, who can introduce the chapters of this uh, co-edited volume. Thank you, Ping. So as Ping has already mentioned, and actually uh, this volume features a hybrid collection of um, scholarly articles and talks and interviews uh, by gender studies scholars and also women writers and, and activists. So in, in this uh, 12 chapters in this very interdisciplinary volume uh, are grouped into three sections. The first section, Chinese feminisms in the age of globalization consists of four essays that delineate the unique Chinese characteristics of contemporary Chinese feminisms at the interface of local and global. The section opens with Nicholas Bakowski's chapter that Ping has already talked about that demonstrates many ways in which Chinese feminists have consistently used the local as its frame of reference to negotiate with different kinds of transnational flows, be they economic, cultural, or theoretical. The next chapter is a talk given by Li Xiaojiang, founder of the Discipline of Women's Studies in 1980s China. It has summit forum sponsored by the Women's Institute of Spain in Madrid in 2008. Li points out that gender equality in the historical context of modern China means not only the sharing of privileges and rights, but also the sharing of hardships between men and women who went through a century of revolutions, wars, and turmoil together. Hence, the Western notion of gender equality fails to connect with uh, the Chinese historical context. 
and local feminist agenda. In her chapter, Xue Pingzhong challenges the binary opposition between class and women's liberation in the post-socialist period by arguing that Chinese modernity has always been classed and gendered. Zhong demonstrates that this feminist tradition with Chinese characteristics, which is displayed through her comparison between two Chinese films with two Indian films, still lurks in writings by and about contemporary Chinese working class women. The last chapter in this section is a recent interview of Dai Jinghua, a prominent feminist cultural critic who alerts us to the specter of polygamy uh, resurrected by the alliance of male dominant power and the transnational capital in 21st century China. Dai argues that while capitalist logic transcends national borders and the gender divisions. It also dehumanizes men and women alike. So both men and women are oppressed by uh, the capital. So it is therefore necessary to reevaluate the legacy of women's liberation in socialist China in the face of global capitalism and the neoliberalism. As feminist theories and practices always go hand in hand and fight shoulder to shoulder, the second section centers on feminist struggles on the ground. All three authors in this section are both feminist scholars and activists. Wang Zheng's chapter examines three cohorts of Chinese feminists, including socialist state feminists and geo feminists around 1995, and the young feminist activists in recent years. So basically, uh, mostly during the first two decades of the new millennium. So in <clears> 20s. <throat> 17, above ground 40 moments of transformation, a photographic exhibition documenting recent demonstrations by young feminist activists was set up to parallel the United Nations Women in the World Summit, which I was able to bring to the Spencer Museum of Art at the University of uh, 2018. And I also saw this uh, question in the Q&A section, you know, asking about, you know, uh, Chinese feminism and one child policy. And actually, when we talk about about this younger generation of young feminist activists and, and one child policies is, is very relevant, but we can talk more about that during our Q&A session. And then uh, the chapter by Li Jun, a journalist who set up the feminist NGO, New Media Women's Network, addresses the question why mainland Chinese male dominant liberals always prioritize human rights over women's rights. Li argues that male intellectuals who are main beneficiaries of post-socialist gender and class divisions continue to uphold the patriarchal, heterosexual, and the pro-capitalist class position and cannot become a strong ally to Chinese feminists. Using the Chinese adaptations of Eve Ensler's The Vagina Monologues as a case study, Ke Qianting's essay discusses creative linguistics, uh, linguistic strategies in the localization of this feminist play. These strategies are effective ways of articulating Chinese women's plural voices and the visions, promulgating locally produced feminist knowledge and advocacy tactics. The five essays in the final section cover the literary, artistic, and cinematic creations and representations of contemporary Chinese feminisms. Liu Jingdong's interview of Chinese writer Wang Yi, Am I a Feminist? demonstrates Chinese women's hesitance to identify with Western feminists. According to Wang, her own female-centered works represent her aesthetic rather than political choices, as well as her reflection on Chinese women's situation in the Chinese historical context. In the second essay, Ping Zhu Zhou Song Wang, his novel Fu Ping, as an example to show how one constructs a different kind of feminine Shanghai, not one of markets and commodities, but one of communities and laborers. Zhu argues that the focus on unproductive labor in this story not only is a protest against capitalist consumerism, but also corrects the socialist blind spot of gender. My own chapter examines the most recent Fan Yu Su phenomenon. Fan Yu Su is a Baomu or domestic worker who is also a member of the Pichuan Migrant Workers Literature Group on the outskirts of Beijing. So here you see two pictures. The picture on the left, that is a picture of Fan Yu Su, the migrant worker uh, or domestic worker. And the picture on the right is a photo of the Pichuan Literature Group. 
Uh, and in 2017, she published an essay called I Am Fang Su on social media, which immediately went viral online and got reported by state and international media, situating this fine's writing in feminist literary tra traditions and the local cultural practices of the migrant workers literature group. I argue that fine serves as a critical link in a new cultural network that is shaped by women workers e-material labor and collective effort in the spread of an emerging grassroots feminism against the post-socialist patriarchy. Through her psychoanalytical reading, Zhang Jie's uh, of Jiang Jie's recent massive sculpture installation over 1.5 tons, Shu Qingcui addresses the question of how to construct a Chinese feminist identity between the translated vocabulary of Western feminism and China's dynamic economy that complicates contemporary gender um, politics. And also thanks to Professor Cui, and we also got uh, the artist Jiang Jie's permission to use uh, an image of this installation as our cover design of the book. Lastly, Gina Machetti's chapter focuses on the importance of a cosmopolitan vision to the ways in which Hong Kong women filmmakers have depicted feminist movements, women's issues, and sexual politics on screen, as well as their contribution to Chinese language screen feminism with specifically Hong Kong characteristics since 1997. Okay, so I guess I'll stop here and then open the floor uh, for your comments and questions. Thank you. I'm here. I don't know if anyone can hear me. Yes. Can okay. Okay. Great. Uh, so we have a number of questions here in the in the Q and A uh, that I will try to combine together because I'm very conscious of the time. And um, so uh, Ping and Hui and Pei, if you could keep your responses succinct, just so we can get to as many questions as possible. So as you noted, you know, one of the questions uh, relates to the one child policy. So if you could speak briefly uh, to how the one child policy, two child policy, three child policy, you know, the Chinese uh, government's um, endeavors uh, to control population have an impact on population how that, uh, those efforts interact with Chinese feminism. So that would be much appreciated. And in relation to that, uh, there's a question, uh, how have the present ideological and authoritarian actions of the current Chinese leadership affected uh, feminisms? So again, one child policy made more of the past, two child, three child, the present, but also thinking about current ideological and authoritarian actions. How is how these affected mm -hmm. Thank, thank you, uh, Karen, for uh, relating the question to us. So I can address this briefly. Fei, uh, maybe in the meanwhile, you can stop sharing the PPT. <laughs> okay, so I, I think I have four points to respond to the one child po uh, policy question. First, any kind of birth control, I think, is objectification and alienation of women's repro reproductive labor. Point two, one child policy in reality sometimes did give some uh, one, uh, like one female child in the family better opportunities for education, and uh, they can also pursue more rights. However, in, in, in uh, some areas, especially rural areas in China, it led to unbalanced gender ratio, really unbalanced gender ratio. Sometimes one, uh, one uh, female child to 1.7 male child. You can imagine what happened to the potential female babies, right? And then it led to a, the last point, it led to a psychological trauma to a lot of the female uh, population, uh, including even myself, it, which we can call it survivor's complex, right? Like uh, survivor. So this is uh, something we can uh, dig later if we have time, but uh, th this is a traumatizing policy, which uh, I think that's a point. So this is my uh, brief response, Faye, if you want to add. 
Ping, I think you have already made a very good points in your very brief response to this question. So I agree with every word you said. And, and I just want to add one more thing, because when we talk about uh, one child policy, we often think about like, a, a, you know, sexual violence, you know, and, and, and the huge psychological traumas and, uh, you know, uh, control of and you know, women's reproductive rights, all those things are very valid, but I, I would also want to add that and actually kind of, um, you know, I, I think it's uh, this unintended consequence of the one child policy. And actually for a lot of uh, girls and the young women, they're the main beneficiaries of the one child policy, particularly those uh, in urban areas, mm -hmm. because they, they are the only child in their family. So they receive this concentrated family investment, both emotional and also financial. And with an uh, elevated living uh, level and also expanded education opportunities and actually a lot of them you know go to college and grow up to be urban professionals and another thing that is very important to this generation that is the expanding access to the to the internet and and the new media including you know social and mobile media and actually uh, that's why I said you know the younger generation of feminist activists they are the main beneficiaries of the one child policy so most of them are college students and the young urban professionals and and uh, um, so they, one of the most uh, active uh, Chinese feminist organizations now actually is called uh, Young Feminist Activists. That is a very loosely structured coalition, mainly networked together through the internet and the social media. So because they have this expanding access to the internet, that means they are more connected to the transnational feminist ideas and the networks and resources. And, and so that is why they could, uh, you know, invent uh, new forms and the styles of gender programs and 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 advocacy campaigns. So uh, in one of the chapters chapters and we have Ke Chen-Ting's discussion about the localization adaptation of Eve Ensler's feminist play a vagina, um, a, a vagina monologues and actually many of the feminist organizations uh, in, in, in China they uh, you know perform the uh, the, the Chinese version of this feminist play, they are members of the young feminist activists. So probably that is this unintended, unintended consequences of the one child policy. But of course, you know, if we can relate this back to the question about this authoritarian, you know, ideology most recently. So as I said, because, um, you know, most recently with this unprecedented publicity of a lot of feminist organizations. So that is why, you know, the the state, the government also got alerted that, you know, the feminist agenda has already, uh, you know, gone beyond its control. So that is why, you know, uh, it started to uh, crack down a lot of the feminist uh, activists, uh, you know, uh, like online and also offline campaigns and a lot of NGOs and the social media accounts, the feminist social media accounts were just uh, closed. Thank you so much for that. Uh, another question uh, that has come up regards uh, connections between feminisms and class uh, and or ethnic status. And you do a great job in the book of talking about how tricky the concept of equality is or equity, right? And you brought that up a bit in the, in the presentation. One thing we really haven't had a chance to discuss much is the connection with ethnic um, status. So could you say a few words about connections between feminisms, plural, in China and ethnicity uh, in China. Um, it, it is, uh, thank you for the question. So uh, it, we, we did not include a chapter on ethnicity and the feminism, which uh, is a pity, right? Uh, I, I, I think there's a lot to say. Uh, I, I think there was, uh, Louis Sacham wrote a book, it's called Internal Orientalization, right? So basically it's, it, it tells us that uh, gender and ethnicity intersected. Uh, as well. So uh, it, it should be included as one form of the plural pluralistic feminisms. So if we can use uh, uh, like the intersecting gender and ethnicity to look at the CC Chinese Communist Party's gender policy. For example, one thing I can say very briefly, one thing very interesting, uh, uh, the CCP the representation of the ethnic minorities tend to portray them as artists. 
like dancing, singing, feminine artists, right? So this is a vivid example uh, to show us how the, the lens of gender can be applied to many social, uh, social inequities, social problems. Right. And, and also, I think we also need to look at, you know, this uh, ethnic uh, hierarchy from the lens of class hierarchy as well, uh, because as we all know, you know, in the ethnic minority areas and, 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 and you know, uh, you have this less developed economy and, and, and also, you know, uh, and, you know, less developed culture uh, in local areas. So again, you know, uh, it's a pity that we, we didn't really include an essay, you know, uh, uh, to address issues at the intersection of gender, class and ethnicity. But I, I, I also want to add that, you know, and actually Gina Machati's uh, essay on Hong Kong feminism addresses part of the, uh, and, you know, uh, ethnicity issue, because I think uh, she made this very um, and great contribution to this collection to say, you know, Hong Kong has this very transnational space and also multicultural and multi-ethnic and multilingual space. So, and actually develops this, uh, you know, new uh, transnational feminist networks to address uh, various types of hierarchies along, you know, ethnic and, 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 and race and gender and the class hierarchies in Hong Kong. So that is the Hong Kong characteristics when we talk about, you know, the screen feminism in Hong Kong. Yeah, and I'm really glad you brought up Hong Kong there because the large uh, migrant worker population and in this context, uh, particularly uh, female domestic workers really um, complicates matters even more. Uh, we're about running out of time. I just want to throw in one final question here about the position of men in various strains of feminism. I and mean, you addressed really well uh, the role that men had in feminism in the early 20th century and how they kind of used feminine feminism was used um, as, as part of nationalism. What about today, right? I mean, how, what is, I mean, again, we're speaking very, very broadly here, but just thinking of uh, social media and how some feminist efforts have backfired on social media, how the term feminist has been demonized uh, for uh, some, some uh, in, in China and frankly, in most parts of the world. So if you would just say something very quickly about that, because I think we have about 30 seconds left. Say. <laughs> Within thirty seconds, uh, so I, 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 so I, I think I, I can only say this in, a, in extremely, you know, uh, grossly general way. So I would say, as uh, you know, Li Jin's chapter in this volume has demonstrated, uh, at this point, um, for a lot of Chinese male intellectuals they they don't become strong allies of Chinese feminists. If, so if they are liberal uh, uh, Chinese male intellectuals and, and they are the main beneficiaries of, you know, the post-socialist, you know, a market economy in terms of the gender and also class divisions. So that is why, you know, they cannot become strong allies of Chinese feminism. And then for the new left, and Ping has also talked about that because they have this blind spot, you know, for gender. So that is why a lot of times they don't think gender is as important as class issues. And also you have male intellectuals in new Confucianism. So talking more, uh, advocating more for the revival of this Confucian patriarchal structure and the traditional family uh, virtues, and actually, you know, uh, that their 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 ideas and 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 thinking um, got endorsed by the government by Xi Jinping himself. So, so I would say, in a very general term, you know, it's probably Chinese families they need to look harder and 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 to to try to find their uh, strong allies in Chinese men in today's China. Thank you so much, Professors Zhu and Xiao. Thank you to our audience uh, for these wonderful questions, for staying with us tonight, and particularly a uh, large thank you to the American Philosophical uh, Association for American Philosophical Society uh, for sponsoring this event, for funding so many scholars at so many different stages of their career. It's really a priceless opportunity uh, for scholars in, in such a range of fields. And uh, thank you, thank you so much for that. So I think this ends today's program. Again, like to thank everyone for coming this evening. Uh, we have um, a 
kicks off a bargain here in the chat. So if you click on the link, you can purchase the book for 30% off if you've not already. Um, and with that, I think we will sign off. So thank you again so much, uh, Professor Saju and Xiao. Thank you, Professor Somber. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening.